There's a lot of great trail cameras out there. I've run the Tacticams, and that's a great system, especially their cell cameras. I've run a lot of different brands that I've, I've recommended to you guys in the past, but the right fit at the right time is the Spy Point trail cameras. I have uh, a couple of the Flex G36s that are cell cams. They do a really good job for keeping track of everything that's going on on my property. And I also have for, you know, kind of out in the back country, I've got these Force Pros. Man, the picture quality on those Force Pros is, is just amazing. If you guys saw some of the bear pictures I was showing you during Spring Bear, that was a Force Pro. Really great cameras. I, I'm really excited that they are, uh, they chose to sponsor the show because I've been, I've I've been using Spy Point for a long time, and, and I think you guys are going to be just as happy as I am with them. And check them out at spypoint.com and let them know the Western Huntsman sent you. Some of you might be old enough to remember back in the day when you can go to Walmart and get you a Savage Rifle for very cheap. And they did a good job, but they weren't, like, equipped for some of the hardcore hunting out there that we do today. If that's a memory that you have with Savage, like I do... I'm telling you, it's not like that anymore. Savage Arms is one of the premier firearms manufacturers dedicated to us hunters. I have this freaking uh, Savage 110. It's the Apex Hunter. And this thing is amazing. I love the AccuTrigger. You can also get them with the AccuFit, which allows you to adjust the stock. So if you're buying them for youth hunters or whatever, or just, you know, rifles fit you different. It's so flexible. It's so perfect for every hunter. It's just not the same Savage that it was 30, 40 years ago. It's a great firearm for everyday use while hunting, and they support hunters, and they support this show, and I really appreciate Savage Arms. Check them out anywhere firearms are sold or go to savagearms.com to find out more. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show... We share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. This is Jim Huntsman, your host, coming at you from the Broken Tine Studio right here in Clark Fork, Idaho. It is July the 25th, and by the time this episode comes out, it might be August. So we are getting close to hunting season for all you September hunters out there, elk season. Uh, boy, oh boy, is it close. So I hope you are paying attention, tuning into the School of September episodes because they are hot and heavy this week, or uh, I'm sorry, last, last week, I should say, by the time this comes out, I released an episode with Sam Davis, who is out of, uh, Sheridan, Wyoming. He's been on the show before and, um, man, what an episode. Check that one out for sure. This week, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about, um, well, about a month ago, I, I announced that we have a new sponsor on the show. And that is Spy Point Cameras. And what I wanted to do before I bring on Trent, who is with Spy Point, uh, we're going to talk a little cameras and hunting and a little bit of everything. It sounds like we might talk about some uh, dairy cow uh, situations going on. Right, Trent? <laughs> it depends on how colorful we decide to get. <laughs> it might get colorful, and, and it usually does on this show. So uh, before before I go down that, uh, that hole there, I want to talk a little bit of, to you guys about... You guys listening know that I am not a, a gear junkie. I've never been a gear junkie. There's two things that I geek out on, and the two things are usually a good hunting boot and trail cameras. You guys know I love trail cameras, and I'm addicted to trail cameras, and I could bore everybody to death on my Instagram with the amount of trail cam pictures I have right up here in, uh, you know, from western Montana to north Idaho to even eastern Washington. Um. And in the past, we had uh, we had a, we had a past sponsor with with Tacticam, the Tacticam reveals, and uh, I know you guys are aware of that. Uh, but what you might not know 
is I've been actually running these spy point cameras for a longer time, and I've I've had them. Gosh, I don't actually. I'll ask Trent this later. So never mind on that point. But I've had uh, I've been I've been using these spy point cameras for a long time. And guys, what there's there's a couple things without making this a big ad about spy point. I want to tell you about them. First of all, the picture quality is excellent, and that's what I like. I hate when I have a camera set up somewhere and this big buck comes walking through, or a bear, or an elk, or something like that, and I can't even see you know, what the caliber of this animal is because it's such a fuzzy picture. That happens a lot on some surprisingly high-dollar cameras where it's really blurry, especially nighttime pictures. And so that's, that's point number one. I've never had that problem with spy points since day one. Number two is the simplicity to use these things. I am not a real techie kind of guy, and you guys know that. Um, So you've heard the struggles of me putting out some of the episodes on this podcast. So you know the struggles I've had with uh, anything technology-wise. And the spy points make it super easy. And if I could figure it out, I guarantee you, you can, because I'm way behind the curve with that kind of stuff. So um, I wanted to just bring that to everybody's attention prior to bring in Trent on. And so now we got that out of the way. We are proud to have Spy Point as a, uh, a sponsor, both for my show and for Eastman's Hunting uh, in general. But uh, on the line, I've got Trent Marsh. He is with Spy Point, and I appreciate you joining me, brother. How you doing? Uh, well, like you said, it's it's getting closer to fall, which, which should mean hunting, but we know how that uh, sometimes goes. But still, yeah. it's... Uh, even though we're in the heat of it at the moment, it, it is nice to know that it's coming around the corner at some point. It is. It's been so hot out here. I don't know where how, how it is where you're at, but it's been so hot. And and I, uh, the nature of my lifestyle, winter is hell. <laughs> okay, uh, it's it's we we get a lot of snow, and I spend a lot of time complaining about winter, even on this show. But it's interesting. The temperatures have been like you know, hovering around a hundred degrees, which is not super typical for this area. And I, I was telling my wife the other day, I'm like, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to be frowning on winter right now. It's, it is so hot. I, I get, where are you at Trent? So I'm in Northeast Indiana. Um, and we've, we've actually been pretty lucky in terms of, uh, the summer that we've had, it's been relatively mild, um, we, we didn't have some of the, the humidity, especially early, uh, in the summer that we sometimes get now we're, we're getting ready to get into some heat, uh, really tomorrow is when it's going to crank up for sure. Um, but we've, we've been spoiled. We were really dry to start the spring was, was honestly our biggest problem, but, uh, like dry meaning you know, lack of humidity or, or lack of rain, no, lack of rain. We, we went three weeks without measurable rainfall, uh, here in May, which is really, really odd for us. A lot of the farmers were really sweating it. Um, a lot of those early food plot guys were kind of wondering what was going to happen with it because usually we can count on, we can count on some moisture through, through that kind of, you know, early, that's still spring, you know, that's mm-hmm. not really summer. It gets to this time of year, August, July, it may dry out, but usually early, that's not a consideration, but man, it was this year. So it's, it's been a little bit of an oddball year for us, but uh, tough, tough to complain, but we're, we're kind of one of those spots, you know, kind of like what you're kind of that same gap that you're talking about in 2013, I believe is the year that ATA was in Nashville that everybody got iced in going into Nashville. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so if ice was in Nashville, Northern Indiana, I think our, we had a, an air temperature of uh, 28 below and the following July. So six months later, we hit 107. So 135 degree swing Holy in six cow. months. We can we can kind of catch both ends of the miserable spectrum here. Yeah, uh, we don't we don't do it often, but man, when we decide we want to, we can make it count. I think you're uh, I think you're the first dude I've ever had from Indiana on the podcast. See, I'm a groundbreaker, uh, groundbreaker, see, it, trendsetter. Yes, it's, sir. Uh, it's just by the nature of what I do. <laughs> do you guys, does uh, the summertime in Indiana is, uh, what is the humidity like? More often than not, it is somewhere between uh, unbearable and intolerable. Okay. Because uh, we, you get all that gulf moisture that comes up. So you have a lot of like, 
DEFCON 1 baby powder days in northern Indiana summers because uh, it will it'll get miserable and we not we don't have the benefit of being on a coast where we get any breeze mm-hmm. so it's nothing for it to be you know temps in the 90s dew points in the mid 70s and a two mile an hour variable breeze it, it can get real miserable real quick oh, man I, I i guess it's it's always good to talk to people from different areas especially somebody that lives in an, a high humid area for those of you listening that have never lived somewhere like that so Trent, I, I lived on the uh, in coastal North Carolina uh, when I was in the service for about four and a half years, <laughs> and uh, I, I'll never live there again. I'll never live anywhere with humidity uh-huh. like that again. Like, yeah. I can bitch and complain about the the weather here, but it, it just I I don't know that there's something different about that humidity. I don't know how you guys. Well, do I I just got back uh, just barely two weeks ago. I was out at gun site. Uh, and that's for folks that don't know the, the firearms training facility down there, Paul, Arizona, uh, was down there for mm-hmm. their pistol mm-hmm. 250 class. And you're about an hour North of Phoenix. So the Valley was quite a bit hotter. Um, but Monday we left the range at four 30 in the afternoon and the car read one Oh four. And on Friday it read one Oh eight. And, no and it was, way, it was man. fine. I mean, you were really? warm. Don't get me wrong. It was warm and we were taking water breaks and, you know, grab some shade when you can. But I'm used to that. You know, when you sweat in Arizona, when it's 100 degrees, sweating works because yeah. the air is dry enough that it actually ev- it, for for those that don't know, this is the science portion of the class evaporation <laughs> of sweat is why you sweat, because that cools you off. But if it's you know, you got dew points pushing 80 that it just it doesn't work. The, that natural system doesn't work. So yeah, we, did, we exactly. did the night shoot. We did the night shoot on Thursday and it wasn't chilly by any means. But I walked back to the car and I'm like, man, it's cooled off really quick because, you know, the sun had gone down, got in the car and it was 88 degrees. And I was just, I just was mm. like, what? Okay, whatever. That's hilarious. This is, I know I'm not in Indiana. That is for yeah. sure. Oh, for sure, man. I, I And there is something to that. I, my cousin, Andrew, he got, he grew up and got married in Las Vegas. And when my wife and I went down there, it, it was, it's like July, right? He, he's like, oh yeah, here's a great idea. We live in Las Vegas. Let's get married in July. So we go down there and like, it's so hot. It's so freaking hot that w- my wife and I went into this Target store or whatever and the asphalt was soft and we were it was like we were making footprints walking into it it was so hot Mm -hmm. but that does not compare to the heat in july or august back east where you have that humidity factor and it is pretty rough on a dude from out west so yeah man um well tell me a little bit about yourself where'd you grow up and and how'd you get to where you're at now So, uh, I've pretty much, uh, was, was born and raised and grew up, uh, pretty much 30 miles from where I'm standing right now, um, in Northeast Indiana around, uh, just between Fort Wayne and Warsaw, um, grew up around here and, uh, kind of anticipated going to college and coming out with a business degree and going to work for one of the big orthopedic firms here in Warsaw, the orthopedic capital of the world, home of Depew and Biomet. They make most of the knees and shoulders that go into to folks around the world. And oh, no kidding. Gra- graduated right about the time of the uh, Great Recession. So uh, landed on some hard times trying to find a find a position, came out and uh, bounced around some different jobs and completely fell bass backwards into uh, kind of just a generalist job with Hawk Optics that's here in Fort Wayne and ended up being the marketing manager there for about five years uh, before I left there. And I've done some work for a UTV company. I've been a freelance writer and consultant in the industry for about a decade now and landed at Spy Point in 2019. Been there ever since. And what what do you do at Spy Point? So my my title now is communications manager. So I've I've been in and around the marketing department basically since I got there. Oh, gotcha. A little bit of everything, which, like I said, done that at done that at Hawk. That's what I did at the UTV place. Uh, you know, I just never, you know, landed into marketing. Like I said, really, it was one of those deals where there's two ways to get a job. You wait for it to get posted, or you just kind of sit in an empty chair and start doing it. And that was kind of how it worked at Hawk. And 
kind of de- decided I had an aptitude for it and caught on fairly quick. So Sweet. been on that marketing communication side ever since. I would make a bold assumption that being from Indiana, you like to chase whitetail. Well, I mean, it's really our only option. So I, I better like it because if not, there's not a whole lot else to do uh, yeah. in Indiana. So, yeah, it, it usually that's pretty much when I'm able to get out. It's after whitetail, the occasional turkey or, or some mediocre bass fishing in the area. How How is the turkey hunting in Indiana? Is it, A lot like Swiss cheese. Is it? It's pretty rough, huh? Yeah. No, I mean, you, there are spots. There's spots where you could have a three bird limit and hunt birds every day of the season. And you go two miles up the road and you could sit and call for the entire season and never hear a gobble. It's just, you know, we didn't have a huntable season here until about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We didn't have a huntable population of turkeys in the state. Um, So it's, I mean, it's light years ahead of, of where we used to be. It's, it's tough to find a, a property anymore that is just devoid of turkeys. Um, but there's a difference between being devoid and having a real good solid population to be able to hunt. Um, so it's, it's just, it's really hit and miss. I had a buddy in the service where, uh, he was from Indiana. And, uh, I remember when, when we got done with all our, you know, like basic training kind of stuff that, after boot camp they put you through in the in the marines they send you to your duty station right and in between that you get to go home and get whatever stuff you want and then they ship you out and uh, i remember he he brought only like a, a a small suitcase and you know he had some jeans in there um and you know whatnot and the other thing that he brought was this photo album of all the deer him and his family had shot off their property uh growing up and he had some measure bucks man it's it's you know the the sleeper state thing has kind of passed we're we're beyond indiana being a sleeper um yeah but you know we went to a one buck rule almost 30 years ago now um and and there's a lot of folks that kind of the quiet joke has been indiana is just iowa with more trees um (laughs) so you know it's it's definitely the habitats here um you know my I don't kill often, but I tend to make it count. Um, 2020, I killed my biggest to date. Uh, I've got him three eighths of an inch shy of 180. Oh wow! Um, nice. So, so they're they're around. You can find them. Heck yeah, man! That's a great buck. Um, do you, do you ever come out west and hunt? So it's it's funny. So I've got some family in eastern Montana. My dad lives in Red Lodge, just outside of Red Lodge. He's a caretaker on a ranch out there. Oh, nice. Um, and I've I've toyed with the idea for a long time and had never made it happen. And actually, I'll be headed that way in about, uh, I guess, seven weeks now uh, or so. Uh, I'll be headed out to Colorado for my first uh, elk hunt. So, yep, I'll be out really? there this fall trying to make it happen. Yep. Archery, rifle, muzzleloader? Yeah, archery. Archery, nice. So uh, you said September, right? Yep. Oh, right on, man. Yep. Do, do you have a bugle tube yet, and you, you practicing your calling, or what, uh, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I've been, I've been rucking for the last couple of months and and uh, taking the bugle tube and the and the calls with me so that I can make sure I can do it while I'm winded. So, nice. Uh, yep, been, been working on it and assembling all the gear and, Picked up one of those, the Reinhardt, the one third elk. You know, I, we moved out. Uh, you know, we we'd been looking for a house for a couple of years. That whole crazy housing market. We finally landed where we're at. And there's this nice little area off the back of my yard that uh, there's like a little kids playhouse with a deck. And I'm like, yep, this is actually going to be a 3D range. So it uh, gave me a good excuse to go pick up one of those Reinhardt one third elk targets and been stretching that out to about 40 yards and just. Uh, Trying to see what we can get done. Perfect, see what man. Happens. That's going to be a good time. I'm telling you, if if you have never had a screaming bull blowing the hair back on your head uh, in September, um, it's it, it, the you should probably just warn your wife right now. Once that happens, you're going to be addicted. I uh, I have no doubt. Yep, yep, I have no doubt. Awesome. Well, I'm, I'll be pulling for you. So. Uh, let's talk about Spy Point for a minute, since obviously you're with Spy Point and and. Um, you know, you do what you do, the communications director, do some marketing, uh, different things that, you know, whatever capacities you have there. Why SpyPoint? What, what, 
what draws like you personally to this product in terms of its quality and, and why you believe in it so so people can kind of hear it from somebody that, that works for them? My, my approach to pretty much, I'm a very utilitarian guy. That's just, that's my approach to pretty much everything. You know, I've, I've just, I've never been, I've never been the, like you said, I'm not the gear junkie. You know, I, I upgraded yeah. my bow for the first time in t- almost a decade, two years ago. Like I just, I'm not, I'm not the gear switcher. That's not what I do. And honestly, before I came to spy point, I didn't use cell cams because oh, really? most of my hunting, no, most of my hunting I was doing within 20 miles of home. So it was always, a. Uh, I know, but I, that's, I don't, uh, Trent, I don't need this, Trent. That's what makes it great, man. You put a you, you put a cell cam on your property, and you get a text at three o'clock in the morning. There's a big buck walking through. You know he's there. I love using my cell cams on property. It took about four days to become fully addicted. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Once I once I came <laughs> over, like I it, it just it was it was one of those things where there was perception and there was reality. You know, Mm -hmm. my perception historically of cell cams, and if we go back to when they started, they were expensive. The cameras were expensive. The the plans to go along with them was expensive. It just it was it was out of reach for most people, realistically. And that's you know, of the part of the spy point story that really appeals to me is the goal has always been making cell cam technology available to any hunter that wants to use it. You know, Spy Point was the first camera maker to have a camera that retailed under $300 and the first one that had a camera that retailed under $200. My first official day on the job was at ATA 2019 launching the uh, Link Micro, which is the number one selling cellular trail camera in all of history. As a marketer, I would love to take credit and say that we did that because of all the wonderful marketing that I was doing. Yeah. But the reality is, it was the right product at the right price that performed the way that people needed it to. You know, when you can, really? when people think a cell cam is going to cost a thousand dollars and you're saying, no, this thing's available at retail at $149 when the next closest on the market was, was, you know, in the mid two hundreds that gets people to kind of sit up and take notice and realize, okay, this is, this is actually a technology I need to be looking at and paying attention to. So well, it's, it's that portion of it that's always appealed to me about the story. You got, uh, the, the link micro LTE on the website mm-hmm. right now is 70 bucks. It's a blowout price. It's it must be some yep. sale going on. Yeah. So this year we launched the LM two, which is kind of the, um, and I will, I will forever take credit for this because it's probably one of the marketing things that I am most proud of. You know, all marketers want to come up with really hot shit, cool things to say that they're proud of, right? But yeah. the tagline for the LM2 is the evolution of the revolution. You know, it, it's not, I, I'm a marketer, yes, but I absolutely hate the hyperbole and the nonsense. Like, I'm first a consumer of these products. So to open up press releases and revolutionary this and proud to launch, like, of course you are. It's just, it's all marketing mumbo jumbo. But again, you go back to the roots of the LM2 and that Link Micro platform, and it is the most, there is no cellular trail camera that has been sold more and is in use more than the Link Micro. So it truly was a revolution product and the lm2 is the evolution of that product it went from 10 to uh, 20 megapixels it got the upgraded antenna brought some of the other you know technologies over from some other products that we've introduced so it was you know the the lm2 came on board uh this year so all the the original the last of the link micro ltes are kind of on their way out the door making room for the lm2s um but uh yeah you, you when you start looking at retail and the promos that different retailers have going on, you got a, a lot of camera options for for not a whole lot of money. I and mean, we don't have a cellular camera right now that retails over two hundred dollars. Yeah, I've got I see I didn't know some of that, so I, I may have went a different direction. I've got these Flex G thirty sixes. Yeah. Um a pretty sweet camera, man. Uh I actually the the one I am super impressed with is this Force Pro. Uh, it's a not it's mm-hmm. not a cell cam, but I run a lot of cameras where there's no cell service, right? So, right, uh, you, you get them back into the backcountry. In fact, I've got one right now that I need to go get. I put it up for bear season, and I haven't been back since. So there's probably some pretty cool pictures on it. 
Um, anyway. Those horse pros are crazy. They got you got oh three my God, video. Yeah, you know, people don't realize good. they've got the three. You've got yeah, you can do 4K and 4K is great. But my favorite is actually 2K because a you put both on a screen and most people can't tell between the 4K and the 2K. Um, but your frame rate's actually higher on the 2K, so it's just it's it's that much smoother and crystal clear, and it's just it's a gorgeous a gorgeous video. And then it also takes 30 megapixel um photos so huh, and that yeah, that the, was also another new camera for this year we added that to, there's now a force pro s available so it's got that integrated solar panel and battery to go along with it mm-hmm. so you're talking about being able to long soak those cameras you know say you've got you know you mentioned not everywhere we know it's it's the year of our lord 2023 and everybody should be able to have cell signal five bars lte 5g everywhere that they are and that's it's just not the way it works especially when you get into some of that rough country and yeah. and things like that not so west, being man. able to just <laughs> put one of those cameras out there and say i'll be back in four months to figure out who's using this draw or what's using this wallow or whatever the case may be it's a great option for that i love i love setting a cam out you know somewhere that's inaccessible during the winter unless you have a snowmobile or even sometimes then you know up here in the north country i I like to put them out around thanksgiving and i'll go back and get them when whenever the pass is clear and i can get back up into that country uh you know which is usually like mid-april and it's it's amazing what you learn about an area by watching it through the winter and i had i had one it was a force it's the uh Actually, it's the older version of the Force Pro. What's that one? There's like an old, old school one. I've had it forever. There, there's so uh, there. Are, depending on how far back you're doing, one there are several. Okay. Anyway, it's it's an old spy point. I've had it forever. Yep. Anyway, I I set that thing out, and, and actually, I set that earlier. I put it out in like August, and just got it in. I don't know. It was, it was towards the end of April because we we had snow for quite a while this spring. Um. Man, the the surprises that like I thought, okay, this this is going to be a great bear area. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see a lot of bear traffic. Nope, not one single bear in that what six, seven, eight months. It was set, but the amount of elk and giant whitetail action I saw, uh, it just it just really opens the door and visually gives you the information that hunters really depend on. Like I know, okay, I'm not going to hunt this draw for, for bear, but Mm -hmm. you're damn right. I'll be up there for whitetail season because I, there was some, there was some bucks on there, uh, that'll bring you to tears as my little brother likes to say. So, um, (laughs) yeah, so that's the force pro. It's, 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 uh, let's see, I'm going back up to what is the cell link? So the cell link uh, is another product that you know we we introduced and actually turns any of those non cell cameras that you have into a cellular camera. So you just there's oh, really? an attachment cord that comes with that that replaces your SD cable or your SD card, and then that connects via cable to the uh, cell link, and then it transfers those over, and the cell link will then send those out, so you can get those photos on your uh, spy point app just like it was a cell cam okay i want to i want to just kind of geek out for a minute here um guys bear with me I, I'm, I'm super interested in this stuff the i, I want to talk about like the the plans and the usage well let me put it this way man when i'm when i i'll set my phone down and i, I like to go through this thing where i'll ignore it for like 30 minutes and when I go back to my phone, there'll be a text message from maybe my wife, uh, maybe my boss, and some news notifications. I don't, I don't let the social media things send me notifications. That drives me freaking batty. Uh, and then I'll have a notification from one of my cell cams. Guess which one of those, Trent? I check first. <laughs> it's going to be the cell cam. It's going to be the cell cam. Don't tell my wife, but it's going to uh-huh. be the cell cam, especially if it's hunting season and I got a cell cam set up uh, on on uh, you know somewhere that's in service. Because I I hunt I hunt. Uh, there's a couple of different methods I hunt. I, I have uh, uh, you know a 26 acre chunk of land here in North Idaho um, that that gets some pretty good whitetail on it, and so mostly that's for I, I take the kids out there and hunt. 
Um, and then I hunt obviously public land, you know, North Idaho, Western Montana kind of country that is just, you know, there's no cell service out there, but Mm -hmm. there's a couple spots I get it. And so it's always wise. I'll go up like, in fact, this is coming up in about a week and a half, two weeks. I'm going to take a cell cam up to, um, I guess I would consider it a honey hole for elk for uh, September archery, but I will go up there and I'll set this camera and I just so happen to have service right there. And I know I've got service by accident because I was calling in a bull on the top of this mountain at one point and my wife texted me and I didn't know I had service, but the buzz kind of threw me off and I thought the bull had buggered off. And so I was responding to my wife's text and this giant bull, a giant, I don't, he wasn't giant, but he was a good six no, point the, bull. And he gets bigger the ones every time I tell the story. The, exactly. It's yeah. always the ones that aren't on the wall. That exactly. Get yeah. Bigger. Yeah. He was probably a, he was probably a 400, 500 class bowl there, Trent. Had to be. Had to be. I, as, <laughs> if least. I remember right, he was an eight by eight. If he lifted his antlers any <laughs> higher, he'd scratch the moon. And uh-huh. uh, yeah, no, he, he wasn't that great. But he, he what what I liked about this bull is he was just like perfectly symmetrical. Great, yep. great set of antlers. Anyway, I turn around, and because I was texting my wife, my bow was sitting on the ground, and he comes out, and he spots me while I'm reaching down to grab my bow, and uh, mm-hmm. boogies over the top of the mountain. But anyway, I, I, I'm going to put a camera there, because for the first two weeks, while these bulls are kind of going through their pecking order as, as uh, you know the rut starts, um, this is going to give me some really good information as to what animals are on the mountain, what, what bulls are moving through there, how many cows we've got moving through there. Uh, and, and it's, it's going to tell me a lot of really good information. What, what do you think tool wise, when you're looking at a cell cam for a tool, what do hunters take advantage of, or maybe they miss the importance of running like a trail camera, uh, a cell cam or, or non cell Is there something I... that you feel like people just don't understand and they should, they should now understand it? It's, it's like just about anything else in that a lot of times folks don't pick the right tool for the job and then they blame the tool for not doing what it was supposed to do. Um, you know, so it's, it's something I always remind people and say, well, what trail camera do I need? I say, well, where are you going to hang it? I go in the woods. Okay. But that's not actually the answer. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to go set that you're in Northeast Indiana and we can't supplement feed here and we can't do mineral sites here, but say you got a food plot, you want to go set this on that. You think about the way that a deer uses that area. Mm-hmm. It's going to mill around on the edges and it's going to take its time. And then when it thinks it's safe, it's going to come out into that food plot and it's going to mill around and it's going to, you know, it's going to browse around because deer don't graze and then it's going to move on that's what it's that's how it's going to that's how it's going to work now think about the if you were to instead of putting it on that food plot's edge if you were to put it on a trail heading to that food plot is the deer acting the same way well typically when a deer is on a trail it's trying to get from point a to point b it's moving fairly consistently and and sometimes speedily so you would not want a camera with the same set of features in both of those locations. And you could, if you had two cameras to choose from that were not identical, you could very, very easily put the wrong camera in the wrong location. You know, if you're going to put it on a food plot or a feeder or a mineral site in places where you can do that sort of thing, that camera can have a slower trigger speed. It can have a smaller flash and detection range because you can be more deliberate about where that deer is going to be when it takes the photos. You don't, you've got more margin for error in taking those photos for the most part. Now on that trail, you want that camera to have a faster trigger speed. You want it to have a quicker flash and uh, quicker detection range so that it can, if it's coming down that trail, assuming you didn't sit it up perpendicular because somehow people are still doing that in the year 2023, even though we've been telling them set it up at an angle so you can catch the deer coming or going, you want it to get that shot as soon as it reaches the detection zone and maybe you want it to take two or three photos in a blast before it takes it again. And maybe there you want it to, then maybe you want it to be on an instant delay. Well, now if you, 
think about that. Even the settings. Well, so let's say you've picked the right camera. You can still deploy it improperly. You take that fast trigger speed camera and you put it on the trail and you have it on one photo with a one minute delay between. Well, let's think about what's going to happen November 3rd. That the hot doe is going to come through there with a 160 on her tail. And you're going to get a picture of that doe and that buck that's 10 steps behind her, you'll never see. Yep. Yep. And then vice versa, you have people that'll take that camera, they'll put it on a food plot edge, they will do a three shot multi shot with no delay between shots, and then to kick it all off, they'll put it on transmit every detection, and they'll wonder why they're running through photo transmission plans and batteries when they've got it on a mineral site, and the same deer standing there with his nose in the salt for fifteen minutes. Yeah, you got I was going to say, two hundred and sixty five yeah. pictures of the same deer for no good reason. So it's just it's it's deployment and thought process about how the camera is deployed to make sure that the the combination of settings and hardware capability match up to give you the best possible performance. Silencer Central. Folks, if you want to learn something new right alongside me, check it out at silencercentral.com. I've never put a suppressor on any of my weapons, but I'm going to start now. And I'm using Silencer Central to help get me started because they walk you through the whole process. To include, you can ship the rifle to them, they'll thread it, they'll put it on, and they will ship it back. And you can make payments on the whole thing while you wait for all the licensing to get approved, which they take care of for you. It's a great process, and it's a great company, American manufacturer, right there in South Dakota, and we are really excited to be partnering with them. So check it out at silencercentral.com or give them a call at 888-781-8778 and let them know that you heard it on the Western Huntsman. Hoffman Boots is my go-to boot i love the explorers in the eight inch and they've got the vibram sole totally waterproof no break-in period they just glue your feet to the mountain you can't ask for more out of a boot and you don't have to break the bank to get a pair so check it out at hoffmanboots.com again another american company a uh, local North Idaho friend of mine who runs this company decided to make some great hunting boots for all people that are serious about getting into the backcountry to chase elk and deer and bear and everything else out there. So check it out at hoppinboots.com. Use promo code all caps lock huntsman 10 at checkout to save you 10%. I, uh, I, I've been guilty of both those things that you said, by the way, earlier. Um, well, your secret's safe with me. I won't tell anybody. Yeah, don't don't tell anybody. But <laughs> the uh, interesting thing is that perpendicular uh, topic where people are setting them just straight at, like against a tree, and it's it's you know I I feel like people should learn before they go set cameras, uh, so they're not learning the hard way like I did. How do you recommend angling that? Because usually what I usually what I do is I will, I'll take like a stick or something and I'll put it behind the camera and it'll be like a, I don't know, an inch in diameter and it'll angle it perfectly down on a trail or over a meadow or something like that. Um, you, you just said my, you, you said my trigger word. What's that? I, I hate that stick. <laughs> you hate the stick, huh? <laughs> I hate, I hate that stick. So, <laughs> so here's. I, I I treat it like sophomore football practice. I walk up to that tree that I'm going to put the camera on, and instead of standing there and mounting the camera, I take a knee. Okay. You get that camera down. Because here's what's happening, okay? When that detection zone on that camera is essentially a flat conical laser that extends from that sensor out from the camera. It is not, it's not a, it doesn't go immediately to the ground and to the sky. It's not Think like, of it it's as not a flat like sound laser. waves, you mean? Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. So if, when you mount that, say you mount at eye level, so it's five feet, five inches off the ground, then you angle it or off the ground, and then you angle it to point it down. And then you think about the angle of that that sensor that's hanging off the front of the camera. You no longer have a 60-foot or 80 foot or hundred foot detection range, because you are essentially shooting that into the ground. You have now pointed that down. You've limited your detection range. 
And sometimes what's even worse than that is you've now created a hot spot in front of a camera because you are shooting your flash into the ground as well. So instead of being able to fill the area in front of the camera, you're, you're shooting it down into the ground and giving it more opportunity for that flash to reflect off the ground. So the next time you go and you go to hang that camera and you want to jam that stick behind it, take that stick, thump yourself in the forehead, take a knee, and mount that thing just about waist high and don't put that stick there. So what it's going to do is it's actually going to get you at a, a better level. It's you're no longer uh, putting that IR flash at the, at the deer's eye level. Now it's lower. You know, they're, they're scanning, they're looking around. And if it's got that IR flash, they may see those little red dots, but if they're looking ahead of them where they're going, they may not notice it as much if it's lower and you're also now going to be able to get more of the benefit of that detection range because you're not shooting it into the ground so what i try to do when i've got a trail that i want to place it on ideally i want to be somewhere between one and three yards off the side of the trail shooting it somewhere between like a a 40 degree 50 degree angle a pretty steep angle to that trail so that when they start coming, I've got a I've got a line on that trail that about ideally 20, 20 to 25 yards away, I'm going to have visibility of that trail so that that can be triggered and I can catch that deer coming or going in that space and I'm going to run that on instant delay. So that if they're walking at a fairly leisurely pace, I may be able to pick up two or three sets of two or three exposures before they mosey past that camera. But what I don't okay. want to do is be shooting perpendicular so that then by the time the camera gets woke up and it, it takes that picture, all you're getting is pictures of uh, deer asses or elk rumps or bear butts because they're already moving past. Okay, so can I can I bring up something that I've ran into that might contradict what your your recommendation is for and maybe By this all is, means. maybe this is just a Western thing or I'm just not I'm 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 just dumb as a box which is at, not out of the realm of possibilities, I, you know, we all know that. Uh putting the camera lower on the tree, mm -hmm. um, bears they get super curious. And I what, I what I've found is when I put them low, the bear will jack up that camera. He'll he'll rip it off. He'll sniff it. He'll or he'll, you know, slobber all over the lens. Or he'll, uh, you know, nose it or rub his nose on it and turn it sideways where it's away from like the bear bait. You know, we hunt over bear yep. bait here. Um, what I found is is if I put it up, and I use your stick that you love so much. <laughs> is that is that accurate? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> it, it, what what happens is they're they'll they're still I mean they're still bears right so they they still get curious and they want to check it out so they'll come up and sniff it and I get a picture of their eyeball or whatever. Uh, I've got a really good one actually. If you yeah, anybody that wants to see some good trail camera pics of bears, jump on my web or uh, not website the Instagram at the Western Huntsman and and scroll down a little bit. This last spring bear season, I got a bunch of them. Anyway. So what I found is they don't mess with them nearly as much when they're up a little bit higher and just angled down, and I still get really good images. Um, and 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 the other point I wanted to make is, I would be one of those guys that would argue that the deer don't really care about the little flashing lights when the camera goes off at nighttime. Uh, they notice it, but it's not like they change anything. If that makes sense, what is your response to both of those? So yeah, bear bears obviously create another problem for not for non cell cams. Security boxes are the way to go because you know like with spy point sixteen gauge steel bears are tough, but generally there's not enough interest in the trail camera to fight with that steel cage. Do you guys now the problem? Sell those? Yep, we've we've got steel we've got steel security boxes for all of our cameras. Now, where you can still run into problems is the the steel security boxes for cell cams still have to allow that antenna outside, which is the you know that is the that's the Achilles heel of the cell cam when it comes to being messed with oh, by yeah. bears. So yeah. so that that is an extenuating circumstance in which yeah you may need to do something different. Um, and so for that specific situation, what I'm going to look for is 
turves or turns in that game trail where I know I'm shooting at a very particular area. I don't want a big, long stretch that that buck or bull can get on and be hauling ass to the next county, and I'm trying to catch that blurry photo, especially at night, because there's nothing you can do about motion blur on an IR blurry photo at night. Yeah, for sure. So so what I'm going to look for is where's he going to have to put the brakes on? Where's he going to have to shift to be able to turn and make that corner? So that I can, uh, and here I would go to the other extreme. I would maybe even take a couple tree steps with me or something like that to be able to climb up and get it eight or 10 feet high. And then I'm aiming it directly at that location. I am shooting for that one particular spot. And I'm just going to have to live with the fact that instead of getting the full detection zone out of that camera that's not my goal here my goal is i have found a point where when that animal moves through he is going to be in the most advantageous position possible for me to get a good photo out of this camera and then just get it clear of the bears altogether so that i don't have to worry about it and of course out there then it also has the added benefit of you know getting it maybe a little bit higher to be able to pull a cell signal where you can get it or throw a throw a booster antenna up from that high location in the tree to try to get it through that way okay i want to go back to something you said there uh or, or something you just said so i can take uh, again trent i don't know if eastman's warned you i i'm really ignorant with this stuff uh in, in terms of the technolo- technological aspect of it i'm having like a i feel like my my tongue is swollen or something like i'm, <laughs> I'm having a hard time talking or something maybe you just make me nervous man is it you <laughs> It could very well be. I'm very intimidating. <laughs> okay, so I've got, uh, again, dumb, dumb question. I've got the Force Pro. I've got two of these Force Pros right now, yep. they, and they're brand new. Uh, I, I ran them uh, up up uh, on my bear sites, and they, uh, I, again, can't say enough good things about them. But you're saying I can take the cell link and connect it to that, and it'll become a cell cam as long as, you know, granted, there's cell service. Yep, it's absolutely... It's the the part of it that not spy point or any other manufacturer controls is that cellular portion. It's coming, it's coming, that camera's coming with an antenna. It's not coming with a tower, two very different things. But if there is a cell signal to be had, um, you know, you can pick one of those cell links up and you can connect that to your force pro. And it doesn't have to be a spy point camera, by the way, if you've got another, a non spy point SD card camera, that you just want to be able to, you know what, I want to put this out here and I want to see if I can get some photos out. You can throw a cell link on there and it'll absolutely do that. Really? Okay. Yep. What, like, is there, is there a cutoff in terms of, dude, I've got some old ass cameras. I mean, I, 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 I think I was one of the first person or one of the first people to ever buy a troll camera when they, well, that might not be true, but I've had it for a long time and I'm pretty old. And what is that one? I bought one in like 1991 or two. I was, I was like, a, I was a teenager, man. <laughs> I mean, my first trail camera was a hand me down from a buddy of mine that still took literal film and took eight D cell oh, really? batteries. Did, yeah. You still have I was that walking. One? No, I do not. Man, that I would do be not vintage. still have it. It How would. Cool would I mean, I'm walking around with a trail camera that looked like a boombox from Run DMC <laughs> back in the day. It was, it was a thing. I always, I always wonder about like the dude. You, you know, we're, we're we're talking about Eastman's hunting journals. You know the the videos they used to make that they used to sell at you know the video stores back in the day. This is eighties, nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, I always wondered about the dude that was responsible for carrying that gigantic ass camera that made the VHS tapes uh-huh. like 10 miles into the back country in Wyoming. I used to literally, even when I was a kid, I'd watch those. I'd be like, God, that poor bastard that had to carry that camera. Those things were like, you know, adding an extra pack to your back, you know, 
But well, um, yeah, I always enjoy talking to Roger Raglan. You know, we've worked with Roger off and on throughout the years, and I always like talking to him about what some of those early days of outdoor TV were like because you know he's he's one of the OGs. He was there oh, doing yeah. it before just about anybody else, and and man, you you get Roger on story time, and and he can he can spin one for you, and it's <laughs> it's it's always entertaining to hear him tell what uh, you know it's. It's horror stories from the good old days is what it is as much as anything because, man, they used to get into some gnarly stuff trying to make outdoor TV back in the day. Do you ever wonder, like you said, the gnarly good old days or whatever you refer to it as, do you ever wonder if some of those videos from some of these old timers that are like older than me and older than you, if it's like what I was seeing about that bull elk that gets bigger every time I tell the story on the show, you know, where... I was texting my wife because I didn't know I had service, and all of a sudden her text message popped up, and this giant bull showed up. Uh huh. You ever wonder if those stories about them, if they get harder and harder and rougher and rougher every time they tell them? Well, all of our parents walked to school uphill both ways, right? In the snow, unplowed roads. We didn't have snow days back in my day. I would never impugn Roger or any of the any of those industry titans that laid the groundwork for us to have the industry that we work at but you know anybody that sat and listened to roger tell a story knows how great roger is at telling stories and that's what (laughs) the great voices of our industry you know it's not it's not that they always kill the biggest deer it's that they're gifted at telling the story of how they got in a position to kill any deer. It's so true. You know, that, it's so that's true. what makes for compelling, whether it's articles, whether it's videos, whether it's, you know, even if we want to bring it forward, even if it's social media, you know, it is not, there's lots of big deer that get killed that nobody gives a shit about the story. People You're care so about right. the story when a gifted storyteller can put it into words or video or or whatever the case may be, whatever that communication medium is, that's a gift. Yeah, man. And it, a lot of very successful people aren't great at killing huge deer, but they're great at telling stories about killing any deer. And and it doesn't even ha- you know it doesn't matter what it is. I've heard my, like my grandpa when he was alive, he was an epic fishing storyteller. Like just uh, these fish, you, you would have thought he was uh, chasing a, a a freaking blue whale, man. It was like Moby Dick was on the end of his boat, you know, mm-hmm. on, up on a mountain lake. And it, it was just, and as a kid, I was fascinated by his stories too, you know. And that's that's kind of a lot of what this is. Um, let me ask you. Let, let's get a little bit deeper here for a minute. You you, you good on time, man? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Nowhere to be. Let let me ask you something. Are are you like flying ties or, 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 or I'm sorry. Are you tying flies or something back there? I keep hearing some some. Uh... No, I'm I'm milling around in my in my little man cave here. I got range day coming up on Saturday, so I'm getting the range bag repacked and milling some stuff around. So sorry, sorry if that's coming through for anybody listening. Sorry. No, no, I hear. It. I I always wonder what people are doing. I like when because I a lot of people you'd be surprised how many people they're like packing stuff for their next hunt or they're yep. you know trying to recover their kids' homework that got eaten by the dog or something. <laughs> so, yep. um, l- l- let's go a little bit more on a philosophical, deeper, whatever level you want to call it. Uh, what do you say to the people out there? And you know they're out there. There's a lot of them, especially out west, that are like trail cameras are you know cheaters and and they're they're getting an unfair advantage when it comes to hunting and they're like naysayers we know that there's a couple of states that have banned trail camera use on public land yeah. uh hell even on private land i, I believe in utah if i, I can't mm-hmm. i'll have to check that i can't remember but anyway. it was arizona was the same way i think was it arizona, arizona was an outright blank, brand, uh, ban as well yeah 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 and so I'm, I'm just curious like somebody that that works for a trail camera company uh, and you market this stuff, and this is this is what your guys' business is. What what is your response to people that are naysayers about it and think that it takes away from fair chase? So, and I, I actually want to answer as not the Spy Point guy first, because whether whether I'm employed at Spy Point or not, I'm going to be an outdoorsman. I'm going to hunt. I'm going to fish. I'm going to try to get my kids into the outdoors. You know that that's who I am. 
whether I'm doing this or digging ditches. So I, I want to answer with that hat on first. Okay. And from, from that perspective, I think it's fairly safe to say that all of us have more demands on our time now than ever. And anything that helps us stay connected to what many consider to be a dying hobby, a dying pastime, a dying way of life, whatever poetic term you want to put to it, anything that keeps us engaged with that while, while staying true to our other obligations is something that should be celebrated, not derided. Um, I'm, I, I know that there are people that'll say, you know, we don't actually need more hunters and, I, I understand the thought process behind the opinion. I, I wildly disagree. Um, yeah, I you know, think, we just I think recent- that's so subjective to regions and, and, and what, you know, species you're hunting. I, I, I want to speak to that because that, that comes up. I hear that a lot on Western hunting podcasts where people are talking about, oh, we don't need more hunters. We don't need new hunters or hunting numbers are down or hunting numbers are up. Let me tell you something. September archery elk hunters are way up. They're way up compared to what they used to be. But the problem is, is when you look at across the board nationally, people that hunt whitetail deer, people that hunt dove, people that hunt cottontail rabbit, those are all way down significantly over 20, 30, 40 years ago. And so I mm-hmm. think that that's when we're, when you're looking at it on like a national scale and, you know, the amount of people that are, are super passionate, and I, I really apologize about cutting you off on that, Trent. No, uh, you're fine. But, but I, I want to make that point because it's it's really important that people understand when you take into account those other type of hunts, whether it's waterfowl, whether it's upland game, whether it's small game, whether it's big game, across the board hunting numbers are down. But specific things are up, like mule deer mm-hmm. hunting is up. Uh, Western elk hunting is up. Uh, specifically archery elk hunting is way up uh, compared to what it was 20 years ago. When I when I used to archery elk hunt, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I'd be the only dude on the freaking mountain. It's not mm-hmm. like that anymore. And so I, 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 and I'm not saying this to disagree with your point because I, I agree with what you're saying. We need more hunters. We absolutely do. I just want them all to be rifle elk hunters. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> naturally, naturally, naturally. Of course. And <laughs> so, anyways, I just wanted to—I I, I wanted to chime in on that point because I never address yeah, it. For sure. But, so that, but get back to what you were saying. So that—that's that non-spy point answer. Okay. Um, and now, obviously, with the spy point answer, I've got a personal, a personal tilt to it because that's what what I do. And and I've actually I've given this presentation three times over the course of the last eighteen months. And I'm kind of going through what the new product is from spy point and, you know, getting back to, there's still a lot of people that don't fully understand the technology and what it does. And I've got a slide in there that, you know, basically says that we've covered everything that cell cams are. Let's talk about what they aren't. They aren't a cheat code. They aren't an easy button and they are not a guarantee of success. And the backdrop that I have for that slide is a collage of about eight different photos of a day walking free range right at 200 inch indiana whitetail deer that myself and another gentleman and one of his sons spent most of 2020 hunting and in one of those photos he is standing quartering away 18 yards because i stepped it off from a tree stand that we sat multiple times Mm -hmm. and to hear the people that want to go after cell cams specifically to hear them talk that deer is as good as dead i know for a fact that in 2020 that deer was seven and a half years old and i'm here to tell you that he made it through last year too that deer has been walking around indiana for almost a decade now and he spent most of the month of November on an 80 acre farm. And I've got in excess of 100 photos of him in the daytime. And I could not get within, nor could the two guys that I hunted with get within rifle range of that deer in that time. Man, so, I love stories like that. They're because they're, they're tangible, man. Uh, I'll, I'll reinforce you. I, my, uh, 
I, I, I you've probably picked up on this, but I'm pretty nutty about spring bear hunting. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever been to the northern Idaho kind of jungle, it's it's real thick, real brushy. Uh, you can't just spot and stalk a, a, a black bear in most cases. You got to have hounds. Or you got to bait them. Well, I bait. Hounds cost money year round. I don't want to spend that money, so I bait. And so I I go set a barrel. And what I do is I, I pop a bunch of popcorn and I take it up to the barrel and then I scent it with uh, Batum 907 products, which is the, the hands down the, the, the most effective uh, bait sense you can get on the market, in my opinion. And I baited a lot. This year, it was my priority to make sure my girls got their first bear. My daughters are 12 and 14. I'm like, okay, we're going to take you guys up. You're going to get your first bear. And uh, it's going to be great. So I, I go up. So I, this this speaks to two things, using trail cameras and, and baiting, because I know there's a lot of naysayers out there that bitch about baiting bears. Think They think it makes it, you know, easy. So I had this bait site, this active site set for about three and a half weeks, Trent. And in that three and a half weeks, I had the Force Pro, because I'm at a cell phone service, uh, trail cam set on this bait site. And I it, it, don't cringe, but I had a stick behind it. And we, it's okay. We've absolved you of the sin of the stick for thanks, this, for thanks, these man. purposes. That means a lot, brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So in that three and a half weeks, I got over 1000 pictures of bears and, oh. uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating on that number. In fact, I have most of them still and I could post them. If somebody wants to question that I got over a thousand pictures of bears. Well, Seven of those pictures were like random deer or elk walking through there, but most of them were bears. And it's because I, I had the settings set pretty aggressively. You know, I was getting, I, every day we'd show up and I'd, I'd have anywhere from 120 to 250 pictures. Uh, some days I only had three pictures, but there were days where I had a lot of pictures because a lot of different bears hit that camera during the daytime. Okay. How many bear tags did I notch this last season? I was t I had a tag, and my two daughters had a tag, and all three of us were armed every time we went, and we went almost every single day for three and a half weeks. My guess is going to be zero. Zero. None of us tagged out. None of us got a bear. My daughter missed a bear. We did, we did get a bear uh, coming in while we were there, uh, and she shot right over his back. But we had this camera set. Over a thousand pictures in three and a half weeks, and none of us tagged out. So don't tell me that setting a trail camera is some kind of fair chase issue. It's not. I have cameras all over the place. I is same with my private property that I hunt uh, my kids on for whitetail. We we have we have the camera set on all the trails where these these deer run. Neither one of them tagged out last year, but there were hundreds of deer on the property that came through, or hundreds of pictures of deer. And so I, I think that that is always something I like to point out is something that is like this perception, the public perception or, or this general misconception that people might have about a specific tactic or strategy because they think that it gives you some unfair advantage and the facts prove otherwise. And I like to, I, I always like to point that out because not only am I passionate about hunting, I'm passionate about having trail cameras. I love having cameras I, i'm telling you right now trent my my favorite part of spring bear is checking my camera every time i go mm -hmm. to it it really is i love watching bears uh that's not true that my second favorite thing is checking cameras so my first favorite thing is when uh the bears come into the the bait site and we, we could sit and watch them and be picky about right. what we're gonna get you know um anyway i think that's I'll, my just, you made a you made a good point go ahead the the other part about it and it, this is a personal thing. I, I abhor very few things on this earth more than intellectual dishonesty and Me the arbitrary, the arbitrary nature of the line that's drawn for specifically trail cameras that are cellular relative to other hunting technology is, is just so, so over the line arbitrary and, and, it, it's just, it's, it makes no sense. You know, I, I mentioned, I worked for an optics company for five years and I'm here to tell you that 
the advancements in optical coatings and manufacturing has done more to extend the hunter's day through rifle scopes and binoculars than anything trail cameras have done. That that's an actual tangible benefit. Yeah. You know, there are a couple organizations who I won't name because, you know, it's not I'm not here to get in a pissing match with them, but they've gone out of their way to say that they will not recognize a trophy that was taken through the aid of cell cams. Now obviously their language is is so poorly worded in that it's there's no real sensible way to make any what is what does that mean does a photo of it in august negate the killing of it in october but that's not even the most egregious part as near as i can tell it what the determination that they have made is that if you as a bow hunter kill a big words Adrian Dak, northern new york whitetail 160 inch northern new york whitetail with a bow but you killed him with the aid of a cell camera because you got a picture of him three weeks ago that helped you notice it this oak flat instead of that one. That trophy is not worth being recognized. Anyone that knows anything about hunting knows that those big woods of New York are just about as hard and those big white tail are just about as hard to kill as anything. I am grateful every day that I hunt tree lines and ag fields in Indiana where my life is really easy consider, compared to that type of hunting. Yeah. Now, The flip side is I can go to Texas and sit a half mile away with a modern rifle with modern optics over a food plot and shoot a deer that walks out into a field. And that trophy is more legitimate than the one taken with a bow in the big woods of New York. That's nuts, man. If anyone can make a logical argument about how that makes a single damn bit of sense, then I'll stand down. I've put that challenge out to about 300 people over the course of the last year and a half, and not one single person will stand up and have that argument with me. It's arbitrary, it's capricious, and frankly, it is a nonsensical way for people who have a fundamental lack of understanding of what and how the technology is and what it does. We've got a problem in this industry of a bunch of tired old white dudes that want to dictate what and how hunting should be for everyone else, regardless of how other aspects of their life have changed. And if that's the tact that this industry wants to take moving forward, first of all, I have absolutely no interest in being part of it. And secondly, I will not facilitate any part of it. It's absolutely nonsense. Man, I like your passion, dude. I do. I I love this kind of shit i i just i think the i think the whole argument is just dumb as fuck Let, let's just be blunt about what what it is the thing is is i'm going to use elk hunting for an example Trent. when you when you're and you're going to see this when you're in colorado too for sure uh you're going to look at elk trails you could tell there's fresh tracks on the trail right you could mm-hmm. tell that those uh, the uh, the droppings they they're within 24 hours there's some old droppings there's some new droppings. You're going to see a, a tree that's been rubbed by a rutted out bull elk that looks like it was, it was like 10 years ago. And you're, you're going to see some other rubs that are like, man, there's still shavings on the ground from that rub. And right. I, I scared him off pine. of it when I walked y- up. Yep. So it, the thing, the thing that I guess the point I'm getting at is I already know whether or not there's a bull elk in the area. What the trail camera is telling me is is it a five point bull or is it a big three hundred class bull? Is uh, like what kind of bull are we 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 talking about here? And yes, does it tell me sometimes bulls aren't super patternable like a like a you know Midwest whitetail? You can kind of pattern that whitetail. You can in the West too. I I, I pattern there. There was one one deer you could uh, set your watch to on my property last year. Elk aren't really like that, uh, especially during the rut. They're they're just not super patternable. So don't tell me I know that at you know eight oh three a.m. this bull's going to come walking up this trail. That's just not how it works. Anybody that says that hasn't spent enough time hunting elk or they're hunting a high fence. Well, uh, and, and, and so, even even at that though, I mean that and that I there's there's validity in the point. But like, like take the example of that 180 inch deer that I killed in 2020. I killed that deer on an 80 acre farm that had five cellular trail cameras on it for eight months solid. 
Mm-hmm. I got every picture that came off of those cameras for eight months. We had one picture of that deer taken four days before I killed him. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That, that, that's I, just I, all. I think that that speaks to the general uh, generality of, is that a word? Did I just make up a word? If you say it, it's a, technically speaking, if you say it, it's a word. That I'm, doesn't mean that it's proper. I'm telling you, Trent, like once a month, I come up with a new word on this damn podcast. <laughs> <laughs> when, okay, I'm trying to focus here. <laughs> Just generally speaking, man, too many people within the hunting space get their peonies in a bunch, and I'm kind of getting sick of it. I'm I'm sick of people fighting over whether or not a trail camera is is fair chase. I'm sick of fighting about whether you know uh, who's a better hunter, a bow hunter or a rifle hunter. I'm sick and tired of of listening to uh i like this camo you like that camo you know blah 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 these little factions within our community is what is destroying the future of hunting and and putting our children's future to be in the outdoors and provide for themselves and be self-reliant and enjoy this very humanistic thing called hunting is at risk because of this shit and and that's that's the problem if you don't like to use trail cameras don't get one Mm -hmm. if 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 you don't like to if you don't like to rifle hunt use a bow if you don't like to bow hunt, use a rifle. If you really want to get weird, use a muzzle loader. No, I'm kidding about that last one. I still, <laughs> I still like to give been, people shit. It, you know, I part of my job is I I do a lot of different podcasts, and I don't know if I'm gaining a reputation of of my opinion on it. So people are asking me, but I I honestly can't think of a podcast I've done in about the last year and a half where we haven't come around to some part of this discussion. And it, it just, it makes me sick to think that of all the skills that hunters and anglers and just outdoor adventure folks have, the one that we seem most willing to show off is our ability to make an enemy out of a friend. Yeah. No, that's a great point, man. That's a key takeaway right there. It's the, again, intellectual dishonesty just pisses me off. I I may be a hypocrite, but typically I know when I'm doing it, I can, I can find, find a way to, to work around it. But the, you know, by and large, let's just paint with broad strokes for a second. You know, by and large, Hunters are the folks in this country that own the a, a lot of our guns. Now, I wouldn't say the vast majority because a lot of folks have become first-time gun overs in the last five years, and yeah. that's there is no better news on the face of planet than than more people going to gun shops and exercising their Second Amendment rights. So, so super thankful for that. But what's that? What's that rallying cry that we like to hear so many people on? I'm um, air quoting our side say. If you don't like guns, you don't have to buy one. Yeah. But then you turn it back around, and those are the same crybaby bitches that are saying, well, I don't want you to be able to use a trail camera. Well, if you don't yeah. like it, don't buy one. But don't I will, unless one. you're, like, don't unless you're paying for my tag, unless you're the one, any part of this, you, you and or some extension of the government are going to tell me, how, I hate antler point restrictions. I hate, no. If you're buying my tag, you can tell me how to use it. Until you are, I welcome you to sit in the corner and shut the ever loving hell up. I do not need your permission, nor do I need your approval for me to go to the field and enjoy a hobby that I like in the manner that is legal that I prefer to do so. Whether it's a crossbow, whether it's a muzzle loader, whether it's a 6'5 Creedmoor, or whether it's granddaddy's flintlock. I don't give a damn, and frankly, I shouldn't have to answer to you what I'm using anyway. Kindly see yourself to your property and leave me the hell alone. Your granddaddy is old as fuck if he was using a uh, flintlock, buddy. Well, you know, I, I think it's John Adams still has a grandson <laughs> walking around somewhere. Maybe it was John Tyler. There's one of them. Yeah. No, the, the whole point of what you're saying is is ab- absolutely relevant in, in today's, you, you know, the thing is, is everything's so politically mo- motivated. Everything's so, the, the, the waters are so muddy, Trent, because everybody's got to have this emotional attachment to some fucking argument. And, and that's where things get get nasty. And, and that's the thing that I've, I've been trying to explain on my show for so long. Like, I, do I, I am not the kind of dude that's going to spend 30 grand and go hunt elk on a high fence private ranch with a guide calling him in for me. Not my thing. Even if I, 
let's say I bought a lottery ticket and I won like $10 billion or something tomorrow. I still wouldn't do that hunt. But does that mean I'm going to make the guy that does do that, does choose to do that? I, I'm not going to hate that guy because at the end of the day, we want a full freezer full of meat. We want the adventure. We want the memory. And and that is what it's all about. And so that I, I think it speaks to your point. Um, don't even get me started on the rabbit hole of what the federal government's going to tell me or what I can and can't do because it, it ain't going to happen, Captain. Uh, so, so it's a, it's a great, I, I, I suppose what I'm trying to get at No, it's a good, it's a good spot to kind of transition to, to wrapping this episode up. However, Trent, I, I feel like we, we could have a really good conversation along those lines because I, I think it, there's a lot of things that need to be said and a lot of things, there's a lot of people out there that agree with what you're, what you're driving at. And I, I think that at the end of the day, when you when you take a look at all these dramatic arguments we as hunters get into with each other, at the end of the day, we have to recognize what the end game is. And the end game is protecting what has been the end game for the entirety of human history. We are hunters. This is what we are all even the even the most extreme animal activist, self righteous anti-hunting puke has a desire to hunt they just won't they won't recognize it and they won't admit it and so they're gonna win if we don't pull our heads out of our asses and stop arguing about whether or not a trail camera is fair chase it's a bullshit argument it's pretty much where i land yeah well brother man i feel like uh i feel like we had a good conversation man Anything else you want to add? I no, I mean, uh, you know, hopefully I didn't piss anybody off, but it just it's uh you know, like I said, that's that's pretty much my response. Dude, I have found you know, whether it like, was my day job or not, it just I I cannot stand I can't stand this factioning that we're doing yeah, and so much either. of this scythe isolation that we're doing. It's anything that we can do to get more people to enjoy the outdoors and Maybe for that kid, it's just checking trail camera photos on his dad's phone. Yeah. And maybe that's all that it is. And that ember just sits there and it might sit there for a decade or two decades. But maybe that memory is what brings somebody back to the outdoors. And anybody that's trying to extinguish an opportunity for that is not a friend of mine. Yeah, I love that. That's a great analogy, man. By and by the way, you you'd mentioned. I hope you don't piss anybody off, dude. I could have fucking Mister Rogers on this show, and he'd piss somebody <laughs> off. Like, it, it doesn't matter. Trust me. So no, you, it, I I like having guys that are, and I, I again I say this a lot, unauthentic or I'm sorry, authentic, unafraid to express your opinion and and really put your best foot forward and in a, from a sense of this is what I feel, this is what I believe, and I want people to know it. I respect that. And I appreciate you coming on my show and, and giving us that because I, I feel like we, we did. You know, we, we talked a lot of trail camera stuff, and, and that's, that's great. Uh, but it's, it's really this philosophical stuff that's going to move the needle in the future going forward. And I think that that is what's going to unite hunters because we have to identify the areas we are not united in and address them, and talk shit. That's how we f solve problems. I th really do believe that. I, I hope we're able to start doing that. Seems like we're creating more than we're solving lately, but I, I hope we're able to correct that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, buddy, tell tell everybody where they can find you, uh, What where they can find Spy Point Camera, and we'll wrap this bad boy up. Uh, obviously, spypoint.com, all, all the products are there. Uh, lots of new cameras came out this year. Lots of cameras uh, still available from some some uh, past iterations. So go and check those out. You can find us on pretty much any social uh, media platform. Search Spy Point Camera, and you're going to find us. Uh, we've got a, a lot of content out there, posting great trail camera pictures from all over the country, all kinds of interesting stuff, and uh, I'd love for people to go check it out. I'm going to have a lot of this in the show notes, guys. Uh, for those of you listening, if you jump on spypoint.com, you can see the monthly plans. They have them broken down 
Um, you know, you have your, like your unlimited, your 1,000 photos, your 250 photos. Uh, I don't recommend the free option, guys. Uh, $0 per month, but it's only 100 photos. And let me tell you something. If you put that camera right in front of some branch that tends to blow in the wind, you're really going to be pissed. And so uh, get that get that 10 or $15 a month plan for the cell cams and set it up. I promise you won't regret it. I, I love how I'm addicted to my cell cams. Uh, I, I check them constantly. I, I, it's They're not only a good way to monitor your hunting, uh, you know, land or property or, or uh, public land, where what, whatever you're doing out there, wherever it's legal, by the way. Um, it's also a great security thing. You guys know that I'm in, uh, I, I sell commercial roofing for a living. Uh, some of my job sites, I get like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, uh, let's say, shingles. Let's say I have, uh, you know, 400 pallets of shingles on a job site ready to go on like a, you know, a, a, an elementary school or something. Uh, I'll, I'll plant one of these cell cams on that and make sure that it's being protected. And I could see in real time whether or not somebody's ripping our company off and trying to steal our shingles at night when we're not there to guard those shingles because they got to, you know, basically set them up in like a parking lot. So the point is like job site security, um, you know, property security. There's a lot of a lot of folks use these. Yeah, at, you know, yeah, they go. They they've got a hunting lease. Maybe they got a small cabin or a trailer or something like that. There, you know, yeah, they've got five or six or eight out in the woods. But they almost always are setting one up there by the cabin too. Uh, and sometimes they'll set a decoy camera up too. Um, you know, put something super visible out there. Let uh, let that jerk walk up and think that he outsmarted you, and, yep. and have that second camera there that. You know, maybe one of those bear damaged ones. You can't tell until you get up next to it that that's a broken camera and too late. That cell camera already got you, already sent the photo, and uh, local local law enforcement will be paying you a visit before too long. Yeah, exactly. We've actually, not not to keep extending the episode. No, I'm you're sure good, man. People I'm, are I'm sick good. of hearing me talk. Um, but for those, I don't know how many of folks that are listening know Justin Martin. He works with those guys down at duck commander there, uh, does stuff with Academy and all, you know, all kinds of other things. He's, yeah. he's used our cameras here for several years. He's actually got that going on right now. Um, he had a, he had a fellow that he's got, it was, I think it was his grandma's house that he still owns, uh, that they're, they're getting ready to like turn it over and rent it or something and had some had some nefarious activity going on around it. And he went back out and set a couple more cameras up. And the, the video he sent me last week, you can see the guy walking up to the house and he saw something. And I, what I, I think he saw the, the IR flash and you can see him turn and he looks right at the camera and he thinks for about a three second and he just heel turns and goes right back on the same path, but nice. he had already looked at the camera and uh, Justin put that out on his local social media and some some kind members of the of the community were were more than happy to communicate that gentleman's life story to uh, make sure that the the right kind of people make contact with him to make sure that he uh, he stops doing those things. So absolutely yeah. a viable use for those cameras. And it's instantaneous too, man. Like on our, our it can be. we've got we've got our 26 acres on the Idaho side. Uh, up for sale right now and y you know i have a camera right at the bottom of the the driveway so i know when somebody's coming and when when we lived on that property we knew okay somebody's coming up the driveway we had we had uh one minute and like 20 seconds before they got to the top and so i knew mm -hmm. i knew when somebody was coming and if there was somebody i didn't want to talk to i'd go hide in the bushes and uh no i'm kidding about that part uh, another great, another great use for them. Again, I'm not trying to extend it either, but uh, I we have chickens, and so my chicken mm -hmm. coop um, where I live <laughs> yep. is under constant attack. Man, the one of the biggest threats to my chicken coop are black bears and skunks. Those two yep. bastards, and so I get an instant photo when if something is approaching my chicken coop, I know immediately, and I'll, I'll you know I'll be in the house or whatever, and I can go running right out there in my boxers and my shotgun and take care of that problem. And, mm -hmm. and so, anyway, there's there's a bunch of uses for them. So, uh, again, uh, great See, episode, we could have we could have we could have just pissed a lot fewer people off if we'd have just spent a week talking about uh, the episode talking about our chickens. I we know. We could have just done we that. Totally could have. Chicken yeah. stories, and everybody would have been way happier. Dude, I had a grizzly <laughs> bear. I had a grizz on my property trying to get the chickens the other day. Um, 
<laughs> we chased it off with a broom. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have any of my guns ready, and he just went running off. No big deal. But yeah, see, I love, I love see, telling now, chicken stories, man. See, now I can't even t- like. I think I've got it rough because we've got some mink right around here because I got a swamp on my property. So we've got some mink. I think I've got it rough, and you're chasing grizzly bears off. No, so now I'm just embarrassed. No, don't be, man. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it's it's easier to protect chickens from bears if you're in town. Than it is a mink. A mink will sneak in there and snatch those bad boys, and you'll like never even know it until the next day. A grizz or a black bear is not sneaking on my property because I got cell cams everywhere. They're not coming on I... where right, and so I'm I'm there. If I'm out of town, the difference is is I can mink proof the coop better than I can I can bear proof it. Bear proof it. I had a buddy that yeah. actually he lost thirty two birds to a mink over the course of two mm. nights. That's yeah. crazy, dude. My, I have a neighbor, um, well, my old place, man, they, they lost like, well, it wasn't 32, it was like six, but it was their entire flock to a skunk in one mm-hmm. night. Yeah. Uh, skunks are ruthless, dude. And so are the damn raccoons and the raccoons can be pretty chicky or uh, tricky. But, uh, anyway, that's the thing Th- Those are what's hard to protect against your coop. And that's why a trail and- camera is good. Uh, a bear. Man, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're out of town, <laughs> yeah, you're, your you're chickens not. are fucked. Yep, you're not doing anything. And it's I we've seen a little bit, you know, and I'm I'm the same way. I've just in the last few years got into trapping. And I, I've made the comment several times that I think the proliferation of backyard chickens has brought more trappers into the fold in the last decade than oh, probably anything yeah. else. Yeah. I'd because agree with that. All these, all these Northern Indiana chicken keeper groups. Hey, I got raccoons in my. Coop. Well, you need to go get a trap. Yep, trapping. I, I would just about guarantee you that there is a. It's not a direct cause and effect, but it's certainly you know correlation is might not be causation, but they're connected. They're definitely connected, man. Um, the this whole uh, like there was this time when trapping was kind of losing its grasp on humanity <laughs> because people were so appalled by trapping you know uh but but after the uh, reintroduction of wolves in the state of idaho we found trapping is the most effective and efficient way to kill wolves right and and it's like you were saying the chicken farmers and and ju- you know just people with backyard chickens Coyote, I mean, coyote, coyotes. You know, we've got the coyote yeah. problem in the east. Obviously, we don't have the wolves, well, Wisconsin, Minnesota, et cetera, but yeah, I'm a little do. further south than that. But um, it's, it is, like I said, I'm, I'm relatively new to it. You know, it's another one of these things that I kind of got into late in life, didn't really have anybody to, to show that to me as I was growing up. Yeah, me neither, man. It is. Man, man is that fun it's to, uh, yeah to to run steel and it i i hate like because of course my trapping season gets cut short because i've got ata i've got shot show so january when i should be hammering out everything it just it doesn't work out like i want it but i always do make a point to get some some steel in the ground yeah and it's yeah. one thing to go sit in a tree and be within 30 or 40 yards of a deer or 100 yards of the deer during rifle season but to go out to that same 80 acres that you deer hunt and go i need to get a coyote to step in this three inch circle you want to talk about a chess game you (laughs) you think bow hunting is a chess game man oh man get there is nothing better than walking up in a trap that actually has a coyote oh yeah that is that is an absolute next level super fun thing and honestly at this point i i look forward to the trapping season almost more than i do deer season well, I've said for a, uh, for many a years, Trent, that the uh, the best hunters I know are trappers first, and mm-hmm. uh, there's there's a lot to be said. You, you really have to know the animals on a very intimate level, and um, yeah, cool deal, man. Well, Spy Point, hey, do they do they need to let them know that like the Western Huntsman sent them or anything, or how does that work? I- it depends on if it's hate mail or support. So uh, it's it's totally up to them. Uh, but no, it, we're we're equal opportunity. Just just come in, take a look around. If you got questions, ask them. Um, you know, it's we are Sweet. obviously we're the end of July. August is coming up. We're really in that kind of home stretch. You know, if if you don't already have your cameras out, get those last few that you need. Get them out there. Uh, get them up and and make sure. 
you know, I'll just throw this last thing in there. Make sure those batteries are fresh and good. Make sure you formatted that SD camera or make sure you formatted that SD card. And, uh, yeah. you know, as, yeah. as much as you may need the sticks for the bears, please try. If you are, if you are in the East in non bear territory, please don't use the sticks. All right, guys, you heard it there. Um, from me personally, guys, I, I highly recommend the Flex G-36. Uh, it sounds like that LM2-, dash, or, I'm sorry, LM2 Twin Bundle is only $180. Uh, that, so that you're getting two cameras uh, for the price of basically, you know, not much more than what just one would be. That's That's a really good deal. And also, for you cheap bastards out there like me, the Link Micro LTE is only seventy bucks right now, sixty nine ninety nine on the SpyPoint dot com website. Uh, and for our backcountry hunters out there that uh, don't have cell service where you're at, uh, that Force Pro, man, I'm telling you right now, from a dude that has run a hundred different types of cameras in his life since I was a kid, uh, that Force Pro is hands down not only the easiest to use, but it's got epic, absolute, fantastic picture quality. So check it out. Um, Trent Marsh, my brother. Appreciate you joining me, man. Stick on the line for just a minute, but uh, let's keep in we'll touch and do this again sometime. Good Sounds time. good. All right, Thank brother. Thank you. Thanks. You made it. That's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please make sure you're following us on Instagram at the Western Huntsman and write us a good review at Apple Podcasts. Thanks, guys. See you next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you 